Hi, my name is Bob Grinia and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today we are going to look at the comic book by Ruby Carrot and Matt Howarth, and it is called Discover Cold Fusion. It's a nice, thick, colour glossy card cover with Bond paper inside. And as I said, it's authored by Ruby Carrot, who wrote all the script, and it's illustrated beautifully by Matt Howarth in consultation with Dr. Melvin Miles and Dr. Michael McCubrey both of which had long histories with Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann and the Cold Fusion field, and this lends a lot of authenticity to the publication. They both are featured and pass comment in the last page of the book, which is great to see. The comic starts off with an overview of man's history with various forms of energy, with commentary on practicality and impacts before moving on to the discovery of nuclear power. In this section, one might have expected to see a mention of Marie Curie and Cockcroft and Walton, but since it is a book specifically about the energy needs of man, it is not really needed in my opinion. It then goes on to give a little history of Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons and how they decided to pursue their hydrogen in metal research, and I think it would delight people to see how that came about. I'm very happy that there is a mention of the Pons and Fleischmann singularity. For those that don't know, this is where they had been loading a 1cc sample of palladium for a few weeks and nothing was happening, so they arranged for the loading voltage to be lowered on a weekend. In my understanding, this would cause the electrostatic pressure to be reduced, and so there would be some desorption of deuterium from the palladium, and this would cause fracturing of the metal and charge separation and knock-on related effects. What happened next, however, when they returned to the lab on a subsequent morning, was that they discovered that the water and glassware had been displaced, the 1cc palladium had disappeared, and there was a hole through the lab bench and a hole in the concrete floor. In the comic book, it is described to be as big as a man's fist, which is the first time I've heard that sort of scale of description. Other reports have said that there was a fine suspension of particles in the air, it's nice to see an illustration, it gives you kind of feeling for what might have gone on in that event. It then goes to spend some time on the difficult competitive situation with one Dr. Stephen E. Jones at the Brigham Young University. And that was nearby the University of Utah Salt Lake City where Pons and Fleischmann were working. And it also sort of goes into how there was pressure on Pons and Fleischmann for them to partially disclose before they were really ready to do so. And I think it really addresses that nicely. Despite them not being able to publish all of the details of their work, the story reports on many replications across the world, and it also shades the failures by research groups that had ulterior motives or they had a lack of perseverance. It then reports the famous news conference chaired by Dr. Stephen E. Jones, where he led the pack to denounce the idea of the Pons and Fleischmann process. I have included a few video links of Dr. Jones when he himself was forced to retire from his university position, apparently because he had challenged a mainstream narrative. These video and audio clips may give more insight as to the only person other than Pons and Fleischmann that is named in the comic. The book then touches upon all the shenanigans, the reputation trap issues and the prevention of funding or publication of related research that has really held this field back. It then talks about those few brave high profile scientists that saw the games being played and called them out. Those who work in this field or who are experienced with the characters will recognise some of the faces depicted in the comic and it's really quite satisfying to see them and know who they are in the context of the story as you're reading through it. So that's really nice. The actual book ends on a very positive note and asks a question, which kind of world would you prefer? And I think it would resonate with many age groups. So as an aside here, in the book it suggests that Jones believed that the Pons and Fleischmann effect and muon catalyzed fusion, for which he was doing research on, could be one and the same effect. And with the more recent work of Leif Homled on excited ultra-dense deuterium apparently producing muons, there is now some emerging supporting evidence that this could actually be the case. 
However, Homlid is suggesting that proton decay is the source of the muons and pions, incidentally, without adequately addressing, in my opinion, how the protons are being forced to decay. For potential answers to that, we have to go further back in time to the Japanese nuclear scientist Takaaki Matsumoto from 1990, and he proposed that charge separation of matter and subsequent clustering led to various electron-driven coherent clusters, and he called these itonic clusters, and that these resulted in the gravity decay of nucleons and nuclear regeneration. This explained, in his instance, both missing crystal grains in the centre of his deuterated palladium and adjacent transmutations. A different mechanism was suggested by the Russian Solon in 1992, where he observed coherence of free electrons in a metal melt, leading to the production of magnetic charges that he proposed led to the decay of protons. This explained the transmutation of elements and proximate missing material in defined structures in his reactor's metal reaction products. Both of these mechanism suggestions were based on observations of similar physical effects, and in my view, only nucleon decay adequately explains the Pons and Fleischmann 1cc deuterated palladium singularity, and hence why they were so keen to never work again with such large amounts of material. So in conclusion, this comic is well-researched, concise and easy to consume. It's nicely illustrated and it would be well-placed in locations as diverse as a cafe, university library or dentist waiting room. People in the Lena community will get joy from recognising researchers in the field that are not named and new people will not be bogged down with names that don't add to the thrust of the story. It takes a lot of work to produce a short script that both frames a story and captures its essence, and it is clear that Ruby Carrot and Matt Howarth have done an exemplary job. Whether you have experience of the subject matter or not, I highly recommend this comic to anyone to have in a choice reading place in their house, office or lab, or as a present for a thinking significant other to enjoy.